In this session, I want us to think through together some questions surrounding Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? And what does Jesus Christ do for us? Both these questions are tackled in the chapter of the book that I contributed, entitled God the Saviour. And so in our session just now, we're going to look at the person of Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is, and the work of Jesus Christ, what Jesus does for us. And our manner of proceeding is going to follow along with the teaching of Scripture and of the Church, seeking towards an understanding of our faith for today, how we might answer these questions helpfully and responsibly to our churches and to the world in the present. These aren't new questions. The questions themselves arise from Scripture. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? In order to enliven our thoughts about addressing this question, on the following slides I've provided some images just to help us think through some possibilities. And the question to have at the back of our minds as I run through these images is this, which of these images resonate with you? And if none of them do, or none of them do to any great extent, then what images are missing? So let me lead you through a brief tour of some pictures. This is a picture of a statue of the baby Jesus, with his mother, Mary, on the left, and his grandmother, Anne, on the right. Jesus, the infant, fresh out the crib. How about Jesus at his baptism? That moment of revelation in which the Father's voice speaks from heaven and the Spirit descends as a dove as John the Baptist baptizes in the River Jordan. Or what about the idea of Jesus defeating the tempter, overcoming the wiles of Satan and rejecting the offers that Satan makes to him? Or Jesus the miracle worker, Jesus with the jars of water at the wedding in Cana, preparing to perform his first sign. Jesus, the leader and teacher of the disciples, here instructing the disciples out in their boat to cast their nets, bring in the fish. What about this action scene from the week of the Passion? Jesus casting out the traitors from the temple in Jerusalem, overturning their desks and jars and containers full of money, driving them away. Christ in Gethsemane, the Spirit having left him, the disciples asleep, standing, or rather kneeling, before his imminent fate, praying that the cup may be taken from him, but that God's will be done. Or this picture from a wax display in America, kind of Mel Gibson picture, the passion of Christ, the one wounded on our behalf. Or perhaps the crucified Christ, nailed on the cross on our behalf. Or the glorious Jesus, emerging from the tomb, the stone rolled back, the only witnesses an angel, the soldiers not seeing the miracle unfolding before them. There isn't Jesus communing with the disciples, receiving fish to eat from them. Or perhaps something more contemporary in the sense of Jesus' relevance for today, the idea of Christ the Redeemer, 
watching over us all, arms outstretched as they were on the cross, yet open to welcome us and beckon us to him. I wonder which image resonated with you, if any. What I might have missed in my brief tour. But I want to close the pictures by showing you one picture which resonates very strongly with me. Some of you may have seen this before. On the left is the original plaster image, and on the right, a much clearer version to allow you to see what's engraved into the plaster. This is from a wall in Rome between the second and fourth centuries, scholars think. And it's the earliest visual representation that we have of Jesus. Now you'll notice that Jesus has the head of a donkey. This is an abusive image. This is an image of a man standing before the donkey on the cross, the human figure with the donkey head. And the caption in Greek, for those of you whose Greek is a little bit rusty this afternoon, simply reads, Alexamenos worships God. This is the God whom Alexamenos, whoever he may have been, worships. A God nailed to a cross. And the implication that that kind of God can only be a figure of farce, a figure of derision and abuse, hence the donkey's head. And yet within this image are already some of the most important things we have to bear in mind when we think about Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is a creature, a human being, able to be nailed to a cross. That precisely that same Jesus Christ is worshipped as a God. And the point that we sometimes miss as Christians because we're used to thinking about both these things that this claim is a radical and upsetting claim. Upsetting in terms of overturning expectations. Defeating existing paradigms of thought. It's news from outside, news one couldn't make up. So how did we arrive at this understanding? Let's think a little bit more about the person of Jesus. When we want to know more about Jesus, we turn, of course, to the pages of Scripture. Not that Scripture is a book of history, objectively written by scientific scholars. We all know that Scripture is a book with a purpose, with a mission. Nonetheless, it's the best source of information we have about Jesus. There are no other sources of that time, or even for many decades afterwards, that shed any light at all on the person and work of Jesus. Let's have a look at what Scripture wants to say about Jesus. On the one hand, it's core to the message of Scripture that Jesus is portrayed as someone very, very human. The writer of the letters to the Hebrews makes this point twice. Jesus became like his brothers and sisters in every respect. We do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So there's a difference, certainly. But the overwhelming impulse of these passages is to declare that Jesus is human, just like us. And yet there's more, isn't there? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. In the Gospels, we read something more about Jesus. The disciples have an experience of Jesus as someone not simply human, but as someone who claims a special relationship with the Father, with God. As someone who preaches and acts with authority to forgive sins, to cast out demons, to oppose the religious teaching of the day. One who performed signs and wonders in front of people. I've mentioned already the opposition to the religious authorities of the day. One who scandalously, controversially associated with the poor, the vulnerable and outcast, even those regarded as unclean. And most dramatically, the Gospels present Jesus as the one who was raised from the dead after his crucifixion. 
This last event of resurrection sheds light on all the other information and accounts and stories and descriptions we have of Jesus in the, in the Bible. Because what they indicate is that early Christians thought of Jesus as being at the center of God's eternal plan of salvation. Jesus was Son of God, Word of God, Messiah, Lord, and Savior. In that post-resurrection period, which was pictured in one of the images of the disciples giving the fish to Jesus, we have, of course, the memorable declaration of Thomas, once doubting Thomas, but doubting no longer, as he says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So much for what Scripture presents to us in terms of the identity of Jesus Christ. But in terms of the teaching of the churches and the understanding of this witness of Scripture, things did not go smoothly. There was a problem. Some early believers could not accept that Jesus was human. How on earth could someone divine, could a divine being, take on flesh? How could that happen? And how could that flesh then be crucified to a cross? That's not what a God is. That's not what a God does. It's just not possible that this is true in that way. We think of the graffito as well. If we claim that God is somehow nailed to a cross, um, or that uh, this human being who is God is nailed to a cross, then we do something so ridiculous that is only worthy of derision. And so a variety of ideas began to circulate that compromised the humanity of Jesus. Some people said, well, Jesus appears to be human, but he's not really human. It's kind of like a projection, an illusion, some kind of phantasm. Not a real human like you and me. Or in a more sophisticated route later, some believers thought, well, Jesus is kind of human. Jesus has a human body. But Jesus doesn't really have a human soul, a human reason, a human mind. No. There was always this idea or pressure on this side of the problem to, to reduce the humanity of Jesus, to say that somehow Jesus was less than fully human. And that wasn't all. There was another problem. Some early believers couldn't accept Jesus as God. And there were some fairly good grounds for that. If Jesus is God and the Father is God, then suddenly you have two gods. And that's not going to happen unless you want to become polytheist with many gods. If you want to leave the Jewish inheritance behind, which always insisted on the oneness of God. There was a real problem. And so a variety of ideas started circulating in this direction. One idea was that Jesus wasn't actually divine at all. It would be like us saying of a film or a chocolate, oh, that's divine. But we don't really mean, unless we're serious about our chocolate, we don't really mean that that chocolate or that film or that book is God. It's just a way of speaking. Jesus isn't really God. He's just a fantastic human being. Wonderful example. Great preacher. Insightful teacher. Or alternatively, and a little bit later, the idea that Jesus wasn't God as God is God. God's sort of top. Jesus is second. There's a ranking, an order. We only have one real God. Jesus is perhaps a half God, a semi God, somewhere in the middle between humanity and divinity. Both those paths then questioned the idea that Jesus was fully divine. So on the one side, a pressure to say, well, Jesus isn't really fully human. On the other, a pressure, Jesus isn't really fully divine. Debates, struggles, and conflicts ensued among Christians. These debates lasted centuries. And the church called a regular series of councils to try and resolve them. I've mentioned three of the most important councils there. You can see that they all took place in the 4th and 5th centuries of the church, these initial councils. 
And each council produced a document, a symbol, a creed, to declare what had been agreed at it. Let's look at one of those which may be vaguely familiar to you, the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed can be found in the Church of Scotland hymn books. It's part of the background of the faith. It's a creed that's said regularly in some churches, though not generally within our own tradition. I put a little star because we call it the Nicene Creed, but in actual fact, what appears in our hymn books rejoices in a much longer name. The name is the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. It sounds very grand. All it means is that the original creed from Nicaea in 325 was later taken up and amended by the later council in Constantinople in 381. So though it's generally referred to as the Nicene Creed, its full title is the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. Either way, here's what's important for us. In this creed, the word of God is described as follows. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. Even if we don't say the creed anymore, we may sing these words, or some of them now and again. Can anyone off the top of head tell me what hymn some of these words are preserved in? Close. I think some of them may be in there. I haven't looked up. Again? Yes, which Christmas carol? Oh, come all ye faithful, God of God. Light, don't ask me to sing it. Light of light. So this is still part of our faith today. And what is the claim being made when we sing those words? That Jesus Christ is God as God is God. Jesus Christ is fully divine. There's nothing lacking in the divinity of Jesus. Not some half God, not some pretend God, not some we just call God. Jesus is God. Whatever God is that, the word is too. So that addresses those people, those early believers, who were nervous about that, who were worried about claiming that Jesus could be called God and be God. At one of the later councils that I mentioned, in Chalcedon in 451, we have this text as part of what its symbol, its statement at the end. Jesus Christ is described as truly God and truly human of a rational soul and body, of the same substance as us, according to his humanity. This is addressing those on the other side, isn't it? It's claiming, yes, Jesus Christ is truly God, but also truly human. Not just pretend human, truly human. Not just a body alone, but also a body with a rational soul, with reason, with intellect. Human just as you and I are. So this builds on the earlier statement to say that whatever we are, Jesus is that too. Sounds like it was pretty plain sailing, but you don't need to spend long in a room with a church historian to know how vexed and complicated these debates were and how long they rumbled on afterwards. Indeed, numerous schisms were caused between various churches which still linger to the present day. Numerous heretics were excommunicated and far worse. New issues arose which hadn't been caused, uh, I beg your pardon, considered by the councils, and they caused trouble. And some of the positions rejected by the councils resurfaced. It's interesting just to reflect for a moment on some of these issues that were raised way back in these early days and how they're still present among believers and those around the churches today. For example, the idea that Jesus is a wonderful teacher, a prophet, a terrific example of how to live life, but not God. No, just hold back on that claim. That sort of idea, which is common even among people not in the churches today, has its relations back in the earliest days of the church. At some points anyway, there's nothing new under the sun. And yet, despite those debates and conflicts, for those who believed, for those who do believe, 
these creeds affirming that Jesus is fully human and fully divine aren't some dry, dusty historical statement. These statements about who Jesus is are the very lifeblood of the Christian faith that we are to understand. They give voice to the Christian experience of encounter with Jesus, and they provide us with assurance and comfort. When Christians encounter Jesus Christ today, they can therefore be encouraged and reassured that the Jesus whom they encounter is human as they are, who knows what it's like from the inside to be confronted by tragedy and temptation, by all the joys and sorrows that life throws our way. And not just that. They can be comforted that Jesus, the one who draws near to us, is the Son of God, the message and embodiment of the compassion of God, the one who is for us and never stands against us. I've drawn a quotation to that effect from the book that sits in front of you presently. Christians believe that the one who comes to meet us, comfort us, and challenge us is the one who was born to us, who walked among us, who died for us and rose again. Though time and everything around us changes, still it is the case this Jesus Christ is the same, a constant presence, comforting and challenging, yesterday, today, and forever. We've been thinking a little bit about who Jesus Christ is. We also have to think a little bit about what Jesus Christ does. Early Christians called Jesus Christ the Saviour. But to call someone Saviour suggests two things. First of all, there's something you need saved from. And secondly, that that person somehow saves you from it. How are we to understand both of those aspects of the question? What does Scripture say? Scripture tells us a lot about what we're to be saved from, and I've just put up four references there. Let me pick out the words. Death, corruption, sin, the devil. Scripture's asked for a short list of what we need saved from. These four terms all feature. Death, corruption, sin, and the devil. It's a question whether these four categories manifest in different ways in the present world. What do people need saved from today? In one sense, perhaps exactly the same things. But perhaps the way we speak about salvation from in our day has changed. Perhaps we need saved from our alienation. Perhaps we need saved from being dislocated in our relationships, for feeling abandoned. What idioms can we think of in the present day to refer to that which Jesus saves us from? If Jesus is still saving people today, what do they need saved from? Scripture also uses metaphors, or many metaphors, to describe how salvation takes place. If we pause and think of some of the terms we're used to reading in our Bibles and hearing in our churches, you'll see that they're drawn from different arenas of life. So, for example, whenever we talk about Jesus as a ransom for our sins, Jesus as our redemption, we're using the language of the slave market. Redemption is literally to buy back. Ransom is the amount that you pay to get someone back out of slavery. Or the more vigorous military images. Passages in the gospel about tying up the strong man. A victory of force of the gospel over the powers that try and defeat it. Over the power of darkness, as Colossians states. Some of the language of salvation in the Bible is about the temple, about sacrifice, about covenant, about the blood of the Lamb. And some of the language, particularly in our own tradition, uh, in the language our own tradition is appropriated most prominently, is legal language of judgment, of condemnation, but at the same time of justification and of righteousness. 
a whole array of metaphors used by Scripture to try and describe what may be indescribable, this event of salvation in Jesus Christ. What's really interesting in light of this diversity is that the church never defined a position on salvation. We were looking earlier at the statements from the creeds and councils, how they wanted to tie down language about the person of Jesus. But in the early church, they never did that for the work of Jesus. They were just satisfied with the phrase, for us and for our salvation. In other words, there was no systematization of these metaphors into one single formula. They existed in all their diversity and were seen to complement and not to contradict each other. At the same time, different writers, different churches had particular prominences or particular preferences in terms of the way they talked about salvation. Some patterns of thinking about salvation focus on the incarnation, which thematic as Christmas draws close to think about God taking on human form in the babe lying in the manger. Here is the essence of our salvation, that God takes human form, that God and humanity are united in this one person, Jesus Christ. Other patterns of thinking about salvation stress the teaching, the ministry of Jesus, the example that he gives, the love that he shows, the compassion he demonstrates, as well as his anger, his righteous anger, in face of sin and opposition. Other models of salvation would think very carefully about the crucifixion of Jesus, that it all comes down to the cross. It all comes down to Jesus dying for our sins in that one event. And another pattern of salvation might think about this theme of opposition, that the whole of the life and ministry and death of Jesus is a battle against the powers of darkness. There are different patterns of thinking through salvation. Again, there's no contradiction between these. But certainly some are more prominent than others. In our own church, and our own tradition, it's often been the cross which has been seen as the central event of salvation. Not to the exclusion of any of these other aspects of the event, but certainly in terms of a focus, in terms of its sign, its liturgy, and its confessions. So what do we do today? How do we capture what it is to be saved today for people to whom slave markets, and sometimes military, or legal images may be one step removed from their everyday life? How might we think about salvation today? We could highlight the restoring of right relationship with God as lying at the heart of salvation. We could recognize on the one hand the divine forgiveness and compassion in front of all people, regardless of where they've been or what they've done, putting away the past that might separate people from accepting God into their lives and from accepting themselves. And yet we might also look forward positively as well, emphasizing the divine vocation to peace and newness of life setting out a future in which we seek to live in harmony with God and with others. It's not changing the message. It's seeking to communicate the message in ways which might make people think and understand outside of the church as well as inside the church. And what does that mean for Jesus? It means thinking about Jesus, the one who was incarnate and crucified, also as the resurrected and ascended Lord who meets us today. The one who is attested in scripture and proclamation grounds our confession of faith. Jesus reveals something to us about the truth of God and of humanity, addressing, comforting, challenging us. And again, that note of radicality, redefining and reorienting all our ideas. Again, not trying to change the old message, but trying to understand how we can make it insightful and relevant for the present. 
We live in an awkward time, sometimes called by theologians the time between the times. On the one hand, the reality and victory of salvation is already here, here on earth, here in time. But it is so primarily hidden and concealed. The victory of salvation has not yet been fully and finally revealed in its heavenly and eternal way to the glory and exaltation, not only of Jesus Christ, but also of his church and the new creation of the world. It's in this time that we as churches are tasked to present Jesus and his work of salvation to the world. Here's another quotation from the book and country. What this means is that despite our manifold errors and evident shortcomings, Jesus encounters us today with the assurance that he has overcome and forgiven all our failures, that we can come before God without fear and call upon God as Father. This means we gain nothing less than a new sense of identity, a new perspective on life, a new orientation of purpose. So, we've thought a little bit together about the person of Christ and a little bit together about the work of Christ and how both might be understood today. I'm going to put up now the questions with which I closed this section in the book that's in front of you. Firstly, why might the early church have thought it so important to confess Jesus as fully divine and fully human? Second, what does salvation mean to you? What are you being saved from? And perhaps just as importantly, what are you being saved for? And third, how might we share our belief in salvation with those who do not know the Christian faith? None of these questions are susceptible of easy or quick answers, either in a presentation such as this or in the conversation we're going to have in a moment. These are questions with which Christians have wrestled for many, many hundreds of years, on which they have articulated many different views, sometimes in conflict, sometimes in complement with each other. So if these questions are difficult to you, if these questions are troubling to you, then rest assured they've been difficult and troubling for a whole lot of Christians for a very long time. The purpose of posing them is not to reach solutions that we can put on the back of an envelope and send to all people. The real purpose is to try and think through what we believe, both in order to try and explore in more depth our own faith and to encourage within us an ability to speak of it to other people. It's not about getting the right answer. It's not really about getting the answer in the first place. It's an exploration, part of our journey of discipleship.